the shuttle service. All security transfers and changes in use of your authority. We pray for the people in Ukraine that be with them, that your peace and protection be around them. We ask that this war situation will just completely stop. We ask your awakening in our lives, in our society, in our country here and around the world that we should look to you for your second coming and be prepared for that. In Jesus' name we pray this all. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> We've been doing a series on uh, the prophetic word of the end times, and uh, one of those a few weeks ago uh, gave to you about the signs of the time. That's why I still have this banner of the Israeli flag up here, because it's the Star David. And May the 14th, 1948, gave us the, <clears throat> the biggest sign that we're in the end times, one of the prophetic word it's in the Old Testament and New Testament. Jesus gave it himself in Matthew 24. And so one of the Hebrew words that we used a few weeks ago about the word sign has to do with a flag or a banner. Well, when Israel became a nation again, this is their flag. And there's going to be a day when Jesus will fulfill the prophetic word from the Old and New Testament. He will sit on the throne of David in the new temple in Jerusalem someday that's going to be built. And this is the Israeli flag. I have no shame in showing this to the public. So many people nowadays are, are anti-Semitic, anti-Jew, and they persecute the Jew. But I'm going to remind them of the prophetic word, a covenant God gave with the Jew through Abraham. I will bless those that bless you, and I will curse those that curse you. And he gave them a portion of the land of the Middle East there. And the day is going to come when they will completely have all the land that God promised them. It will be fulfilled. So that sign here on the pulpit is a reminder. The whole scenario about the end times is not about the church. It's not about the believer. So many people think, the Christians have in their head, that this whole thing about the end times is for them and the church. It's not. The whole thing about the end time is centered around the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, the Jew. We are a part of that in that we were grafted in. It talks about that in the book of Romans. We're grafted in. And so there'll be a day come when the Messiah, who is the Jewish Messiah and the Christian Messiah, when we will be united in a new way and that uh, be a thousand years of reign with Christ sitting on the throne and we're going to be with all believers amen, amen. it's going to be something now when we look how do, do you prepare for the end times well the first thing that has to be done you've got to be born again not just a church member so many people in America think that they're going to heaven because they grew up in a church and they're members of some church that does not save you you have to personally ask Jesus Christ to come into your life as your personal Lord and Savior. You're looking at a fellow that grew up in a Baptist church all his life, baptized at the age of seven. I didn't get born again sitting in church one day. I got a revelation from the Lord that I was lost at age 29. And God, I went through a process. Well, look where I'm at today. Uh, I had no idea until God woke me up. So John 3, 7, Jesus said that you must be born again to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Nowhere does it say living right, obeying the Ten Commandments, or having your, member, uh, your, your membership on a church roll somewhere. He never said any of those kinds of things was going to give you a born again experience and take you to heaven. When you're born again, it's the Holy Spirit doing a miracle in you of saving your soul and changing you. You will be changed. If you've never been changed, you've never been born again. <clears throat> I thought I was, and God woke me up. Now, I want to get directly into some of the preparations that I believe the Scripture teaches us for the end times. 
Praise God that you're sitting here today, you're born again, and you believe that uh, Jesus is coming back and you're looking for his return in the rapture. But today we're not going to talk about the rapture. I'm going to give that to you at another time. The rapture is a part of the second coming of his first stage for the church, the born again believers. But what I'm going to talk to you about today is actually his second coming. And we know that uh, we see all the signs around us, especially now this sign with Russia. That was prophesied in Ezekiel 38 and 39 I gave to you several weeks ago uh, that they're preparing Europe for a 10 nation common market to revive Roman Empire. And when all that scenario gets, gets ready, then there'll be a war with armies headed up by Russia to go and destroy Israel, which God will not allow, he will destroy them. If you go read it in the Bible, Ezekiel 38 and 39, a lot of people ask me about that because I mentioned it so much. I said, you need to go read it for yourself. Don't just believe what I said, believe what the Bible says. So look at 1 Thessalonians 3, and uh, we'll look at verse 12 and 13. Some of the things that we ought to be doing in preparation for when the Lord comes is in verse 12 and 13 of 1 Thessalonians 3. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love. And he's talking about the God kind of love, agape. Love towards one another. Now, that has to begin in the local church. And then it has to go out into the world outside of these walls. And that's why I believe in sharing tracks with people everywhere I go. Because it opens doors up. And if I don't get to lead somebody to Christ or be a witness, at least I've handed the word of God to somebody to, to let them take it home or put it in their car. And uh, it's amazing how God has opened up doors in this town and, and this county really for tracks that uh, the businesses are handing out. And they don't have my name on it, they don't have the church name on it, all they have is the word of God in it. Because that's all they need, amen? We're just supposed to put it out there. So, the Lord make you to increase and abound in love toward one another and toward all men, even as we do towards you. Now, the Thessalonian church was doing things right. The only thing is they had believed in false doctrine that the Lord had already come. <laughs> and he hadn't come back yet. But see, that's how false doctrine gets started. Somebody comes in and says, wait a minute. And so you got a heretic given a heresy. Now, he gives a word in verse 13. The end, to the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all of his saints. So what is this one telling us to do? That we should be increasing, growing in the love of God towards one another and towards people out here in the world. That's why Jesus died on the cross. We're going to be celebrating uh, the time that he was crucified here in, in a few days you know a week or so and then the resurrection Easter time we have two important events that the world needs to know Jesus came and he died and he was buried on the third day he was resurrected from the dead and we celebrate actually for the Christian every day should be a celebration of that not just uh, Easter time now if you go to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I've given this scenario to you before uh, about a comfort that we can give one another that Jesus is coming back for us. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that's physical death, that you saw not, even others who have no hope. See, there is hope beyond death. There is hope beyond the grave. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, Jesus will, will God bring with them. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain, here's that word again, unto the coming of the Lord. 
shall not prevent those or pre pre precede those that are asleep, uh, those who have already died physically. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel. That actual word in the Hebrew, not, not the Hebrew, but the Greek in this instance, is a summons. Have you ever gotten a court summons? It's got your name on it. It's got where to go and the time to go, and you better be there. <laughs> well, when Gabriel, it says that uh, uh, the trumpet will sound, the archangel will sound the trumpet, that's Gabriel. You're going to hear a voice, and you're going to shout, it's going to be your name. A summons got your name on it. You're going to hear your name. Now, that's very personal. You say, well, how can God do that? God can do anything. He's the creator. And everybody's going to hear their name at the simultaneous time. And everybody's going to hear this shout. What is this shout about? It's about the Old Testament Feast of Trumpets, which is the trumpets harvest of souls. It's what this is about. It's very comforting to know that when a loved one dies, they're not dead, just the body. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That's where we get the word rapture from, a snatching away, a catching away. We'll meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall ever be with the Lord. Zechariah 14, 4 talks about the same spot he left the earth, the same spot he's coming back on the earth. And we'll ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. All the things that we're going to be going through on this earth you and I can comfort one another with a realization Jesus is with us in what we're going through and he's coming back for us. John 14 talks about that. He's coming back. He's gone to prepare a place for us and he's coming back to us to take us there. Amen? That's some shouting right there. This, this home down here is not your home. This is temporary. All right, let's go to 2 Timothy 1.7. So we can increase in the agape kind of love and we can comfort, give God's promises to one another and rely on that. This one here is about fear. One thing that I'm seeing in a lot of people today is fear. We don't know what's going to be happening. But we know this. Whatever's going to take place God's going to fulfill his prophetic word. And while he's doing that, he's going to take care of his people. And that's the Jew and the Christian. Now look at this, I believe, is a promise. And 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, For God has not given to us a spirit of fear. Well, I want to ask you a question. If God didn't put fear on you, who did? The enemy. It's an interesting, when I look in the Greek at this word spirit here, it has to do with several definitions. It, it can be the spirit of man, it can be a demon spirit, and it can be the Holy Spirit. The word pneuma is breath, and it has to do, that's where we get the, the English word pneumonia from. So the spirit of fear in this instance is not from God, so it's coming from the enemy's camp, the kingdom of evil, the kingdom of darkness. Now, why would, why would the enemy want anybody to have fear on them? Because that's how he defeats us. He defeats people with fear. You see, fear is the opposite of faith in God. What does God want us to live by? The just shall live by faith. Amen? So we shouldn't be fearing. We should be faithing. <laughs> We should be putting faith to work instead of fear to work. Now, how does that get started? It starts up here with a thought in your mind. And if you dwell on that long enough, that fear will come down and settle in your heart. What does the Bible tell you to do with that? Greet fear in your mind with faith in your heart. Jesus is there and he's going to take care of your every need. That's the promise of his word. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but God's given us power. The, the Greek there is dynamos, which is explosive miracle power of God at work in your life. I'm a miracle. You're a miracle. Amen? 
And daily he gives to us miracles if we would watch and listen. God's given us the spirit of power, the Holy Spirit's anointing, love. That's his love, his nature. And he's given to us a sound mind. What does a sound mind mean for a Christian? A mind that's at peace, a mind that's at ease, and a mind that knows his God and knows that God is in control. Amen. Not your circumstances, not the world, not the devil. God is in control. Everybody say, God is in control. God is in control. Period. So don't let fear take a foothold. You ever tried shutting a door? You know, I know when we were kids, we was always playing hide and seek or whatever, and, and we would put our foot in the door so nobody could shut that door. And that's what this term means. It comes out of Ephesians. A foothold for the enemy. Don't let fear have a foothold in your life. Rebuke it. Put faith to work. Put the Word of God to work. The Word of God, if you get in it, builds you up and takes faith out. All right, let's go to um, 2 Timothy 4. And here is something we should be doing in preparation for the Lord's coming. What did he tell us to do until he comes back? To proclaim his word. To take the gospel, the good news, everywhere we go. So 2 Timothy 4, 1 and 2 iterates that, reiterates that. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ that you should judge the quick and the dead. Who, who shall judge the quick and the dead? The word quick there in the King James means living. If you got a new translation, you got the word living. And the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. You see, right now, you're under his kingdom authority and you're living in his kingdom spiritually, but someday he's going to establish his kingdom right here on earth in the natural. He's going to have his spiritual kingdom here in the natural. But we have that in us now when we're born again, the kingdom authority and the kingdom of God lives in us. Jesus told that to the disciples. And then verse 2 says, preach the word. Now what does that mean? You have to go around and be a preacher? No. Let me tell you something. You're preaching the word of God by the way you're living, first of all. How you're living is preaching something. It's telling who you belong to. It's giving evidence of who you're, uh, what kingdom you belong to, what kingdom you're living under. But I believe it means your life and to publicize the scriptures, the word. That's why I'm one of those track freaks. I've been all my Christian life always giving out the word of God everywhere I go. There's a few and a lot of them, because they belong to different cults, I know which ones they are and that will tell you, well, uh, I don't read those kinds of materials. Well, I know what's going on with them because I've had a few talks with someone who said, why did you tell me that? And I had some that were honest with me because they belong to another kind of uh, religion that was not of Christ. And so they didn't want what I had to say. I said, okay, that's fine. But it's very rare that people reject the tracks I give them. It's very rare. But there are some. But I don't let it uh, defeat me or, or make me lose heart. I keep doing it. In fact, I think I told my wife one time, if I go first, you put my Bible in one hand and a track in another hand, when they embalm me, you, you put... You tell them to put that track in that Bible in each hand <laughs> as a witness. In fact, I did that with a preacher friend of mine uh, in Corpus and took him back to his hometown. And uh, his wife said, in fact, I'm going to tell you the verse that he taught me years ago. He was a uh, spirit-filled Southern Baptist. It was Revelation 12, 11. I believe it's 11. Uh, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, the word of the testimony, and loved not their life unto death. In Revelation 12 there. She had me open that Bible up and put it on his chest with his finger on that verse. He lived by it, he believed it, and he taught it, and he taught it to me. 
And I've been teaching it ever since. It's something that defeats the enemy. Amen. Make sure I gave you that verse right. Yep, it's Revelation 12, 11. I've got it underlined in my Bible. They overcome through the blood, the word, and they love not their own lives. All right. Uh, so he says, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, re reprove, that means correct, rebuke, that means to warn, exhort, that means to encourage, with all long suffering, long suffering means to have God's patience while you're doing it, and you're doing it with the doctrine. The doctrine is the word that means to teach the truth. Teach the truth. Amen? Amen. Now let's go to Hebrews 10. And we see another preparation in these end times. Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. This one here is to encourage one another to continue to meet together. Our church, in the last 20 years, in May next year, I'll be here 20 years. We've had over 48 funerals. Lots of folks that have moved out of town, retired, some moved out of town, some went to attend another church one time about 12 years ago. And we're down to just a handful of people. But God has kept these doors open and he's going to continue to do it. Sometimes I get to wonder, Lord, where are you? What's going on? Because I get discouraged when I don't see more people coming. And we've got some people that should be here. They're not here today. I know where some of them are. I don't know where some of the others are. I don't know where they are. But I know this, I thank God for you people today that you showed up. It encourages me as a minister and a pastor and someone that loves y'all that you're faithful to the Lord in being here and doing what God wants you to do, that we can be a lighthouse and this church can continue to function. So these verses remind me of that. In verse 23 and 24, let us hold fast. Everybody say that. Let us hold fast. That's what we got to do together as a small group of, of uh, believers. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit is faithful that promised. Now look at this. Verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. That means encouraging one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. What is he talking about? When Jesus comes back. Someday when Jesus returns, there's going to be no more chances to be here and to be a witness in this world. That, that'll be all over with because we'll be with Jesus. But let me tell you what verse 25 is. It's not a suggestion. The verse is structured in such a way that it's a command. It's a command for God's people to be together and stay together in a local church. Now when I say that, it's not just a church building. It's the believers that make up the church. The Greek word is ekklesia. Ekklesia means the ones that God has called out from the world to be his church, the born again believers, in a local area. This happens to just be a building that we meet in. But the importance is this, that we are to be together. And that's because we need one another. We are the body of Christ. He's the head. And we're members, spiritual members. And that's what makes us the church. Amen? Amen. And I don't know about you, but I need you. I love to teach God's word. I love to witness. I love to minister to the Lord, but I need people to help me. So I'm hoping and praying that the day will come and we'll have more people here. Uh, now let's go to 1 John. I'm going to be closing with this. 
in 1 John 3. Now, we knowing the Word of God and we knowing the signs, the Scripture gives us an instruction about keeping ourselves pure, keeping ourselves unstained from the world. It's going to be very tempting, the more rough that it gets, to start falling away from the Lord and His local assembly of believers. And we don't, we don't want to compromise His Word. We don't want to compromise our love towards one another, our love towards the Lord. We want to be faithful. And to do that, we've got to stay out of sin. So 1 John 3 and 1 to 3, we've got some more instruction plus some more promise. Beloved, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knows us not because it knew him not. Jesus said, the world's going to hate you because it hated me first. So if we're going to be living for Jesus and doing what he wants, the world's going to come against it. But let me give you a promise that Jesus gave in Matthew. The gates of hell will not prevail or overcome the church. Jesus has given us through his name and his blood authority over the enemy. So always remember that. The enemy cannot win. He's going to hell forever. He's a loser. We're on the winning side and we have the winner. We are more than conquerors through Christ who love us. Romans 8, 37. Jesus. Amen. He's the head. Not the devil. Not us. Not the world. Jesus is the head. But look at verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. When did you become a Christian? The moment you received Christ your Savior. So many people think this verse is talking about when you die. No. Now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know. That is a divine knowing. We know that when Jesus shall appear, we shall be like him. And the Greek is a very interesting uh, several words. The word like him, similitude, appearance, newness. We're going to be exactly like, in other words, we're going to have a body like he has. This wall means nothing. You walk right through it. It's like he did in the upper room. It's a new way we're going to be living forever. We shall be like him, for we shall see Jesus as he is, face to face. In fact, there's a song we sing about that, face to face. And every man that has this hope, the hope of seeing Jesus, the hope of being changed into his complete likeness, what does the Bible say? This hope that we have in us, so purify yourself even as Jesus is pure. In other words, keep yourself clean, uncontaminated from the world. The world is like a huge magnet pulling at us to get us away from the Lord and away from each other. And that's the enemy. Don't let him do it. Keep your sins confessed up. Be faithful to him, to his word, his prayer, and local attendance of his local church. Be faithful to him. And you know what? God will honor that, and he'll bless you for it. Now, I just close by putting a verse down at the bottom of your bulletin in Psalm 32. Eight. It's, it's a promise. And we're going to have to keep this promise every day. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. Who's going to instruct us? Who's going to teach us? Who's going to lead us the way that we should go? God himself. Through his son Jesus. Through the Holy Spirit's presence. That anointing. He's always there. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. And I will guide you with my eye upon you. 
You know, something I remind my, my kids and my grandkids and people in general, I try to, to tell them, in fact, I've got a sign back here in the back of one of these buildings, because we had a bunch of hoodlums here one time I tore a bunch of stuff up. And I put on this sign, God is watching you. You see, the, the scripture said, I will guide you with my eye upon you. You cannot get away with anything. Now that's the negative side. The good side is he's going to be watching you and everything. So that means he's going to be protecting us. We need his protection today in every way. And thank God. I thank God for his angels. They're with us on the highways. There, there's so many times I could have died prematurely because I was stupid and did things out of, uh, I was like a young idiot that, that says no to death. I, I mean, you just, you do death defying things as, as, as you grow up. You ever done stupid stuff? <laughs> like jumping off of buildings and things? I mean, there's a law of gravity, my sake. I mean, anyway, how can we live successfully to where we can be prepared you know we we know we're going because he saved us but we need to stay faithful to the promises that he gives us in his word don't let any of them go when things come up in your life and you say oh i need some help well guess what god's right there and he's got a word for you right then and there he's got a promise for you to claim amen and it is so comforting and gives you such peace to know he's there and that his word backs it up and you go to his word, boy, it's a foundation that you can walk on. You just put faith in it, believe it, and just walk in it and walk with the Lord. It's a beautiful way to live. Amen? God has not given to us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Father, I want to thank you, Lord, that You've given us the prophetic word to let us know what's going on in the world today and how we can be prepared as your servants to be faithful that when Jesus comes back, he said, well, I find faith at work on this earth. And I hope he finds us faithful in doing what he wants us to do. And we thank you for it. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, today is the day of decision. First of all, are you truly born again and do you have that assurance and peace that you are saved that you're going to heaven that you have no doubt about that if there's a doubt i would ask jesus right now to come into your heart to be your lord and savior i don't care how many times you've been in church how many memberships you have in churches the moment is now to say yes i need jesus to come into my heart my life change me and make me into what he wants me to be as his child and his family. And then Christian, are you really ready for these end time scenarios? Is your faith up to date? Is your love up to date? Are you serving up to date? Don't be uh, empath uh, indifferent, uh, have apathy, uh, I don't care, I'm too busy. And in other words, get rid of all that stuff that makes you an unfit servant and say yes today lord keep me fit keep me usable to be a witness in these days and lord we'll be grateful and thank you for it because we know you're always faithful to us and help us to be faithful to you and we ask it in jesus precious and holy name and everybody said amen, amen. praise the lord